Welcome everyone to the next panel of this roundtable, which is entitled Comparative Perspectives from Africa and Asia. The session was originally two hours long and is now a bit shorter. So I'm going to introduce all four speakers now uh, to save us just a little time. I've also uh, asked the speakers to keep their remarks as close as they can to 15 minutes to leave us some time for discussion. So we will hear first from Charles Fombad, Professor of Law at the University of Pretoria in South Africa, who will speak to judicial appointment practices in Africa. We will hear second from David Bilschitz, Professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, on judicial appointments in South Africa, have the constitutional provisions performed. Then we will hear from Professor Han Daiwan, Professor at Renmin University, in Beijing, China, on China's judicial independence and judge selection system. And then we will hear from Associate Professor Uday Shankar from the Rajiv Gandhi School of Intellectual Property Law on female judges in the constitutional courts, influence of gender on judicial decision making. Charles. Thank you very much, Adrian, and, thank, and good morning, everybody. Let me start by thanking Adrienne and Shira for inviting me to take part in this very important discussion. I'll be talking about uh, judicial appointment practices in Africa from a comparative perspective. I'll talk about the trends that have taken place in the last three decades. Let me start by saying that one of Africa's main challenges in the last three decades has been the need to restore confidence in the judiciary. The main reason for this is that during the long years of dictatorial rule, judges were stripped of their independence and appointed at the whims and caprices of the executive. For example, one of the causes of the post-2007 electoral violence in Kenya was the fact that the person who was widely recognized by the international community as having won the elections refused to go to do the, the what he derisively referred to as President Moi Kibaki's courts. That's the extent to which people did not have confidence in courts. During the post-1990 constitutional reforms in Africa, there were serious attempts to limit executive control over judicial appointments. So my paper provides a comparative perspective of the developments in Anglophone and Francophone Africa. It seeks to determine to what extent these reforms have limited the executive's ability to manipulate judicial appointments. I will start by providing an overview of the appointment systems in their historical context. I will then take a critical look at the two main judicial appointment boards, that bodies that operate in Anglophone and Francophone Africa. Then I undertake a critical assessment of these two bodies and then I end with some concluding remarks. So let me start with an overview of the appointment systems. Owing to the diverse colonial background, Africa inherited different legal traditions, which in turn have led to different ways of selecting judges. Despite differences in approach, the two main ones that dominate, the common law approach in Africa, Anglophone Africa, and the civil law approach in Francophone, Luxophone, and Hispanophone Africa have come under a serious challenge. In fact, the collapse of judicial integrity affected both legal traditions, even if to different extents. My comparative approach focuses on five countries in Francophone and Anglophone Africa. And I divide them into two groups, the progressive countries and the conservative countries. For the progressive countries, I take two in Anglophone Africa, namely Kenya 
and South Africa, and one in Francophone Africa, namely Benin. For the conservative countries, I take one in Francophone Africa, namely Cameroon, and one in Anglophone Africa, namely Botswana. Although during the colonial period, British colonial administrators controlled the judiciary and made all judicial appointments to depend on the colonial administrator, at independence, they bequeath a relatively independent judiciary. However, within a very short while after independence, the executives in Anglophone Africa emasculated the judiciary and took over control of judicial appointments. In Francophone Africa, the model of judicial independence adopted was, shape, was shaped by the obsessive Gallic fear of legal dictatorship through government of judges. So due to the mistrust of the judiciary, post-independence constitutions relegated the judiciary to what they referred to as judicial authority, which was entirely subservient to the executive. Let me look at the constitutional developments that have taken place since the 1990 reforms. To assess these five countries, I have selected a number of factors to determine the extent to which the ability of the executive to manipulate the judiciary has been limited. Firstly, I look at the overarching protective principles, such as the duty to assist and protect the judiciary, judicial diversity, gender balance, and so on. I look at the appointment processes, who makes the appointments, and how the appointments are made. I looked at qualifications for appointment, the conditions for removal, tenure, the role of judicial appointment bodies, and the role of the president. Time doesn't allow me to go into a detailed analysis of these different factors of the different countries, but let me just say a few general things. Firstly, although the judiciary in Francophone Africa is no longer merely a judicial authority, but now a judicial power, the precedence under the Constitution remains the guarantor of judicial independence. This clearly suggests that the two branches are not co-equals. Secondly, the appointment processes are more elaborately defined in Anglophone constitutions as compared to Francophone constitutions. Thirdly, the qualifications for office, which is probably one of the most important factors in judicial appointments, are clearly spelled out in Anglophone constitutions as compared to Francophone constitutions. The common law approach has been to appoint judges from legal practice, while the civil law practice has been to appoint ju judicial judges who have gone through formal training in a school of magistri magistracy and become career judges. There have been changes in both traditions. For instance, in Anglophone Africa, there are now attempts to formally train judges in some judicial institutions. And in Francophone Africa, there are some efforts to appoint judges from legal practice. Fourthly, at the very heart of the judicial appointment process is the judicial appointment body. The overriding objective is to have a body that is independent and not amenable to influence or control by any person in authority. In this regard, the difference between the judicial appointment bodies in Anglophone and Francophone Africa is really stark. In Anglophone Africa, you have the Judicial Service Commission, and in Francophone Africa, you have the High Judicial Council. And there are a few very significant differences between the way these two bodies operate. First, there are no regulatory values and operational principles which guide the High Council for, ju for Judicial Appointments in Francophone Africa as compared to the Judicial Service Commission 
in Anglophone Africa. Secondly, in Francophone African constitutions, the constitution is silent on the composition of the appointment body. As a result of this, these bodies are usually packed by government supporters and sympathizers. When we look at the Anglophone constitutions, they try to provide an inclusive judicial appointment body, but the extent to which the members are directly or indirectly appointed by the government varies from country to country. Thirdly, the judicial service commissions in Anglophone Africa are usually presided over by the Chief Justice with the, and assisted by the Deputy Chief Justice. Whereas in Francophone Africa, the judicial appointment body is presided over by the President of the Republic, assisted by his Minister of Justice. Often, it is the President who convenes the meetings of this body. And fifthly, the weight given to the decisions of these appointment bodies also differs from Francophone Africa to Anglophone Africa. In Anglophone Africa, the Judicial Service Commission makes recommendations which the President is bound to follow. By way of contrast, the Judicial Appointment Body in Francophone Africa merely assists the President or gives him an opinion. This is rather ironical because this body is chaired by the President himself, so it virtually advises him. Let me make a few comments about the effective operation of these bodies again. And here the question is whether they operate in a manner that ensures the selection of competent, well-qualified persons who cannot easily succumb to executive pressure. And in doing so, I look at it from four perspectives. The appointment system and judicial independence, the appointment system and the transparency of the process, the appointment system and the quality of judges, the appointment system and representativity. Let me start with the appointment system and judicial independence. Because the appointment body, because the appointment body in Francophone Africa is under the exclusive control of the executive and the detailed rules which, under which it operates are made by way of ordinary legislation, there is really little prospects for the appointment of independent-minded judges. The opposite is true of the Judicial Service Commission in Anglophone Africa, although it depends on the nature of its, its composition. Talking about the appointment system and the transparency of the process, here again we see that the appointment body in Francophone Africa, which as I pointed out earlier, operates under the chairmanship of the president, assisted by the Minister of Justice, is com completely opaque. It is the minister, is the president who convenes it. It is him who determines his agenda, and it is this body that gives him advice on what to do. By way of contrast, most Af Anglophone appointment bodies are chaired by the Chief Justice. And most judicial positions are advertised, the criteria for appointment are spelled out, and the applicants are interviewed in public, and an evidence-based approach to selection is adopted. If we look at the appointment system and the quality of judges that emerge, we see that in Anglophone Africa, the constitutions usually clearly spell out the criteria for the appointment and the minimum number of years that the judges is required to have served in practice or in academia before he qualifies for practice. We compare this in Francophone Africa where you have the career judiciary. Although longevity and experience is taken into account, what usually trumps is political considerations 
and not really competence. And we'll look at the appointment system and representativity. Here, if we know that a key factor in building confidence in the judiciary is the extent to which the bench reflects the composition of society in terms of race, gender, religion, and ethnicity. And we look at the way this is treated in the constitutions of the five countries, we see again clear differences. Whilst the, the constitutions of the two Francophone countries say absolutely nothing about this factor, the constitutions of the three Anglophone countries, Botswana, Kenya, and South Africa, detailly spell out that gender factors have to be taken into consideration. Let me say one or two things about the challenges that have emerged before I conclude. The first problem is that of design flaws. In spite of the radical reforms that have taken place to improve the appointment systems, one could say that in Francophone Africa, it has not changed much. Secondly, in spite of considerable improvements in Anglophone Africa, the efforts by the executive to capture the judiciary through the control of the appointment system remains really potent. A number of instances in Kenya and even in South Africa show how the executive is making serious efforts to take control of the appointment systems and appoint executive-minded judges. By way of conclusion, one can say that whilst there is no perfect judicial appointment body, a few conclusions can be drawn from what has been happening in Africa for the past three decades. Firstly, it is clear that political involvement and sometimes interference is common and inevitable in all systems. However, between the system in Francophone Africa and the system in Anglophone Africa, the Francophone system is heavily flawed and politicized. Secondly, the pressure to reverse some of the progress that has been made in the appointment systems is very strong. The executives are relentless in seeking, particularly in the case of the Judicial Service Commission, to recover, or in the case of the system in Francophone Africa, to retain their dominance in appointing judges. Judicial representativity, especially of women and other minorities on the bench, remains a very serious issue, even in progressive countries such as Kenya and South Africa. I'll conclude by saying that in the increasingly volatile political climate that prevails in Africa today, the, and the struggle to sustain its fledgling democratic transition, the choice of who sits on the bench to adjudicate this, this dispute will continue to intensify. Thank you very much for your attention. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry, we just have a technical problem because the thing's not projecting. Um, but uh, firstly, let me uh, congratulate uh, Professor Deva on, uh, on an excellent conference. I think this is a really important topic uh, worldwide, and I think uh, dedicated attention to thinking through uh, what kind of judicial appointment procedure uh, is best and comparing with one another is really important. 
Um, and my sense is that uh, we would sort of come up with a kind of range of possibilities, some clearly bad models and some uh, better. Um, so, um, I, I, I mean, it's actually very good because uh, Professor Pombat has kind of laid the scene of the overall African context, and I'm going to go into more detail into the South African situation. Um, my presentation comes to some extent from a report that we did a couple of years ago for International Idea on the performance of the South African Constitution. Now, the notion of whether a constitution performs is itself a complicated idea, okay? And you're going to hear me reference some aspects of that. I will explain to some extent what we're doing, but I don't have time to go in detail into the methodology. If you're interested in this report, the International Idea website, you can just look up the performance of the South African Constitution. There's a, a brief report version, and then there's a longer report version, and the judiciary is the fifth chapter of the big report, okay? So those of you who want to look at that, and this is being replicated in other countries. Now, to start off with, and we can move on to the first slide, uh, is we, we need to set the scene in South Africa on the historical context, right? South Africa, prior to its transformation into a democracy in 1993, 94, was a parliamentary sovereignty system, and the judiciary played a central role in legitimizing the apartheid system. Law, apartheid was implemented through law, and the judiciary had to adjudicate on those laws, okay? Absent a Bill of Rights, the judiciary also had limited powers to invalidate unjust laws. They could only pronounce on procedural aspects. Nevertheless, there were, as in all systems, and there's interesting work on this about judging, of how judges could more or less try and work with some gaps within the law, and some judges try to avert the worst effects of the law, and others try to give effect to the law fully. So there were interesting issues around that. Now, the judiciary was not in the past representative or independent. Appointed judges were generally white males. They were conservative and perhaps shared the government's fear of rule by black people, right? Um, there was an attempt during the 1950s where the judiciary, in fact, stood up to uh, the government in what's called the colored vote saga, which dealt with the removal of colored people from the voters' role. Colored people in South Africa are mixed race people, okay, from the voters' role in, in the Western Cape. And uh, what happened was essentially the National Party government, there was a long saga, enlarged the appellate division and appointed a number of judges, which eventually led them to approve their, their rule to move the mixed race or colored people from the voters' role. Okay, the judicial appointment process was not transparent. There was no public input encouraged or permitted. And there was no process for judicial discipline or disciplinary actions against judges. So you can see against this background, there was a large task for the Constitution to do. The nature of the judicial role changed. We were moving to a situation of constitutional supremacy. The composition needed to change dramatically, as did the process of appointment. Um, and um, important to note that what the interim constitution allowed apartheid-era judges to continue to sit, okay, as judges in the new era. So what do you do? You're going to grant the power to strike down legislation and executive orders to the same old judiciary? You couldn't do that. So you had to have a reform of the institutional structure itself, and that hence came about the need for a constitutional court with a whole set of new judges. Okay, so we move on to the next slide, and um, uh, the next slide, please. And then we uh, basically, uh, just to tell you where we're going, I'm going to briefly tell you about the goals of the order, um, the appointment scheme, and then we'll look at how to evaluate the judiciary's performance against the scheme. Okay, and I'll end with some recommendations. Okay, so we go on to the next slide now. And um, the first step in performance is what we talked about this, as I said, is an interesting whole methodology based on Tom Ginsburg's work of actually working out what are the goals of a constitutional provision, okay? And the first step is to work out what the internal goals of the provision are. Now, sometimes those internal goals are on the face of the provision, and sometimes they have to be interpreted, right? This is no, there's a qualitative dimension to this, so we're not pretending it's absolutely objective, but nevertheless, there's an attempt to understand that. Right, and there are two main components for appointments dimension, which and there some others we deal with in other respects um, in this regard. The first was representativity, we've heard about today, to create a judiciary that is representative of the South African population on the grounds of race and gender. And then we saw the need for the judiciary to reflect broadly 
the racial and gender composition of South Africa. We heard Professor Shikrik talk about the need for reflection, re not representativity, okay? And so we see that word mentioned in the Constitution. And secondly, independence to ensure that appointed judges and that the judiciary as a whole is perceived to be and is in fact independent. And we see the requirement to act without fear, favor, and prejudice. Okay, so those are the two main internal goals I'm going to talk about. And the next slide I discuss the issue of external goals. Okay, basically Tom Ginsburg says that you can have a constitution which is essentially, and this comes from th theory, you can have a bad constitution which is essentially, essentially doesn't meet the requirements of any constitution, right? It's essentially designed to harm the people and etc. and doesn't meet the basic requirements. Now this is controversial in itself, but he identifies four external goals a constitution should meet. In brief, it should be legitimate. It should channel conflict, okay, in society, into institutions. It should deal with agency costs, okay, which ultimately means that people should, that institutions should not operate in their own interests. And finally, it should achieve public goods. And just to mention to you in relation to judicial appointments and legitimacy, um, this is concerned here with whether the judiciary is an institution that is regarded as legitimate in the eyes of the South African public. And that maps well onto the internal goals too here. So in terms of representativity, an almost exclusively white male bench would have been reminiscent of apartheid and would not enjoy legitimacy. Similarly, with independence, a judiciary that is perceived to be politically partisan and not independent will not enjoy legitimacy. Okay, so the next slide, we deal with the appointment scheme and the role of the Judicial Services Commission. So in terms of appointments, a new, as we heard from Charles, this is common now in Anglophone Africa, a Judicial Services Commission was established as a constitutional body. The commission's composition is essentially made up of appointments from different branches of government. So there are six members, for example, from the National Assembly, half of whom have to be from the opposition, four from the National Council of Provinces, the second house, four from the executive. There are two from the advocates profession, two from the attorneys, one professor of law, and then uh, 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 yeah, and, uh, uh, and it makes up, I, I think I forgot one lot, but it makes up total, there are 23, right, it's, which is one of the problems of the inst institution itself, but it's meant to be a wider, uh, it's meant to represent different parts of the society itself, okay? Uh, oh yes, the president appoints four as well, right? Now, the primary functions of the JSC is to interview candidates for judicial office and make recommendations on appointments to discipline judges and to advise the judiciary, okay? In terms of this, Chief Justice, the President appoints the Chief Justice and Deputy Chief Justice, as well as Presidents and Deputy Presidents of, of the other super High Court, after consulting the Judicial Services Commission and party leaders in the National Assembly. And this consulting word has also caused problems in South Africa relating to what happened in India as well, we heard yesterday. Judges of the Constitutional Court are appointed by the President after consulting the con uh, uh, Chief Justice and party leaders on the National Assembly, but on the basis of a list presented by the Judicial Services Commission. So the Judicial Services Commission presents a list to the President, and the President has to choose from that list. Okay, he has no discretion, or she has no discretion to go beyond that. Okay, and on acting judges, the President appoints acting judges of the Constitutional Court. If there is a vacancy or a judge is absent, the appointment is usually made on recommendations of the Minister of Justice in concurrence with the Chief Justice and acting judges of other courts appointed by a minister in consultation with the senior judge of the court where the candidate serves. The Judicial Services Commission is not involved in the performance in, in, in um, appointing acting judges, which we, as we'll see is a problem. So, moving on to the next slide, how do we evaluate whether this has achieved the goals of the Constitution? Right now, performance, again, assessment of performance is a complicated issue. We divided this into what we called thin compliance and thick compliance. Thin compliance simply relates to, in some senses, has the, has the scheme of the Constitution been given effect to, right? And in a sense, thick compliance deals with where there's more substantive development of the scheme of the Constitution. Has it in real terms? Has it just not been formally passed, but is there substantively been given effect to? Okay, so has the government here responded to the express constitutional mandate regarding judicial appointments, passed the necessary legislation, etc.? Okay, so on the next slide, I explain to you a bit about representativity. Significant progress has been made in shifting the demographics of the judiciary. In 1994, there were 166 judges in South Africa. Only three were black and two were female. In 2015, there, are 230, there were 239 judges. It's changed a bit now. 105 black, 24 colored, mixed race, 24 Indian, and 86 white. 
and about a third of the judiciary are now women. So gender is still a problem, okay? We haven't got to parity, but nevertheless, you can see there's been a major shift, okay? In terms of independence, significant progress has been made in ensuring appointed judges are independent. Um, the Judicial Services Act of 1994 has been enacted and, and the commission has been put in place and functions in relation to judicial appointment. And there is a process in place to ensure nominees are screened, they are subject to public vetting, there are public hearings, and there's a deliberate attempt to change the closed secretive nature of the apartheid appointment. On the next slide, I deal with um, thick compliance, which is a more qualitative assessment than the thin compliance. Has the Constitution actually created a judiciary that is representative, independent, and which enjoys legitimacy in the eyes of the South African public? Okay, so on the next slide, I look at representativity. Has the Judicial Services Commission succeeded in making appointments consonant with the transformative vision of, of, and the spirit of the Constitution as a whole? So here we hear something similar to what happened today. The Judicial Services Commission has a difficult task of fast-tracking representativity requirements without compromising on the high degree of competence and excellence required by the judicial role. And there have been criticisms made by the, uh, of the Judicial Service Commission, sometimes for overlooking talented white males and female candidates in the pursuit, for example, of racial uh, uh, um, transformation. Okay? So there's also an issue between race and gender, and that doesn't always, they don't always uh, uh, overlap so well. Okay? So, uh, and there's some examples which I won't go into. We also did a survey in relation to this, this research. Public perceptions of the judiciary suggest that it is viewed as being representative, suggesting there is thick compliance with this goal in terms of legitimacy. Okay? In our survey, which only surveyed the most populous province, Gauteng, 64% of respondents surveyed believe that the courts reflect the race and gender composition of the country. The view that the bench is largely representative is strongly held by black, colored, and Indian respondents. And interestingly, only 29% of white people felt that the bench was representative. Even though the bench is not representative, it's got more white people than the population, 36% of the bench. So this has to do more to some extent with white people feeling that they've lost out. Okay? The next slide deals with um, independence. Has the Judicial Services Commission succeeded in creating a judiciary that fulfills the spirit of constitutional provisions for independence? And here there have been some problems. There's a concern that the African National Congress ruling party has tried to use its dominant position on the Judicial Services Commission to ensure the appointment of judges who will be sympathetic or deferential to its policies. In 2009 round of appointments, the interviewing of candidates was notably inconsistent. Some were asked more intrusive questions, some were asked aggressive questions, many some were asked nothing on experience and contribution. At least this is all public, so you can see it, right? Others were not asked probing or challenging questions at all. Uh, the Judicial Services Commission also had time to appointed persons that have been heavily criticized by the public. There is a strong position that, uh, perception that judges are willing to make decisions though, which are not favorable to the government, sometimes are overlooked for appointment. Although I, that, that we can temper that a bit in recent times because there has been strong willingness to do so. Consultations process envisaged by uh, the, the provisions in relation to the Chief Justice are problematic. Uh, the President in 2009 and 2011 announced his preferred candidate for the Chief Justice before consulting the relevant party. Okay, so he essentially didn't comply with the actual constitutional provisions in many ways, but said he was complying because he consulted them after he had already made up his mind, which doesn't make a lot of sense because it's meant to affect the way his mind is made up. Okay, and the appointment of acting judges is a serious problem. They are not appointed by the Judicial Service Commission, but by the executive alone, and this is believed to give the executive too much power. So at the moment we have four judges on the Constitutional Court who are acting, and they didn't have to go through that same process. So you can see the problem of being able to pack a court, uh, although this, as I say, fairly that hasn't really happened in South Africa. The judges have generally been quite independent in terms of the outcomes that they've given. But nevertheless, from an institutional point of view, this is a problem that you can, you, you can appoint acting judges without going through the same process. So in conclusion, uh, given the short amount of time, I've only been able to give you headlines, but in terms of representativity, the, the fact that race and gender are singled out in the Constitution is obviously critical in light of South African history, but it can also sometimes lead to a shallow conception of diversity and fails to ensure that representation of other groups is included. So perhaps sexual and cultural minorities, people living with disabilities, etc. Also, maybe there can be people who are, let's say, more conservative who are black and, and people who are more social justice oriented and white, 
and it doesn't allow such more fine-grained uh, analyses to take place, or that's not how the Judicial Services Commission has engaged with it uh, as much. It is also uh, um, uh, constitutional amendments should be considered to provide for possibly other aspects of diversity in relation to appointments. And on the last slide, I deal with the question of independence. Uh, the Ju Judicial Service Commission arguably is, it, it was a real step forward. And I, I actually believe the Judicial Services Commission model is probably one of the best models that exists in the world currently around appointment. At the same time, what's crucial is how the model is, is, is constituted. The model has a ratio of 65% of politicians to only 35% of legal professionals. And this allows political considerations to have undue weight in the appointments process. Okay? And I, uh, I think that this is a qu question of how you, how you compose the Judicial Services Commission in a way that it, isn't, uh, it, that it doesn't have uh, or allow for undue weight uh, to political considerations. Unusually large as well in terms of the size of its members. 23, which is very much larger than the African counterpart. And this has often caused problems with decision making and very difficult often also to ensure all members are present for all the meetings. So the recommendations we actually made was to amend the constitution to reduce the size of the JSE to some extent and reduce the number of political appointees to sort of have a more of a balance in relation to the appointment of acting judges. As I said, this is a problem from an independence perspective and that the constitution should be amended to provide for oversight of the Judicial Services Commission to permit the Judicial Services Commission to be involved in the process. In relation to the Chief Justice, we also thought that the Chief Justice should not have a separate judicial appointment procedure. It should be the same procedure as with constitutional court judges, and the President should only appoint upon a recommendation by the, um, by the Judicial Services Commission and should have not as much discretion. And then on disciplinary matters, which I couldn't deal with at length, but there have been a number of serious disciplinary matters that have arisen in the last couple of years. There's no constitutional mechanism that was dealt to deal with con uh, judi judicial discipline short of removal. And this was a design flaw in the constitutional scheme. They have attempted to legislatively deal with this, but it's crucial that judicial discipline be dealt with in, uh, so that that does not undermine independence. And there have been some cases in that where, where, where that has, has raised questions of independence. And so there's a need for improvement in those areas. So I hope I've given you a short primer about the broad schema in South Africa and some of the issues that we're facing, whether it's achieved its goals and whether it's performed. Overarchingly, let me just say that the judiciary has played a crucial role in South Africa, right, in actually bringing about, helping to bring about transformation, in addressing issues around the rule of law, and particularly in light of the, te the attempt of, our, of, of, of an attempt to really entrench corruption in the state. The judiciary has stood up very strongly and arguably played a role in the change of leadership, political leadership as well, by highlighting failures that have occurred in corruption in that area. So overarchingly, there's been, we, we, we regard it as a relatively good success story, but with a number of tweaks that are necessary. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So um, yesterday uh, we are um, talking about um, the why we need uh, the uh, judicial independence in the modern society. Uh, we shared the uh, wonderful experience of different country, the especially uh, Indian. So uh, independence, the uh, philosophies and the practices. Uh, I'm a good experience to um, uh, visit the Supreme Court in the India. Uh, the uh, wonderful uh, the culture, the wonderful the justice, the clear the terminal way, Indian uh, independence theory and uh, philosophy and the practices. Today, I uh, my topic is the focus on the the uh, China's judicial independence and the judges uh, selection. I can't the uh, provide Asian the. Uh, uh, some ideas because China is the very um, uh, complex, but now face the huge uh, challenges. So I like to introduce the, in the China thinking and the China reform and the focus on in the future how to guarantee judicial independence on the China uh, the future. You look at some uh, two uh, uh, the um, the. Uh, the uh, St structure. This is the, I think that um, 
when we go into a better understanding rule of learning China, I think about them, um, look at that. The, there is a different element from the different, but I think about them, um, where is yeah, important is that um, the guarantee human rights, that's the rule of law. What is the rule of law in China? That is, they are making the consensus about all the people, uh, including communal parties, leaders, and the public audience, and uh, all the people understand that the human rights, that's an important issue in China. Second is that um, uh, separation and the uh, check powers. On the NPC, on the community parties policy, we can do that. Power must be a separate. Thirdly, that um, the guarantee judicial independence. That is very, very important that, um, for China. Uh, if lack the judicial independence, we can do that anything. Because judicial independence guarantee human rights and guarantee all the powers separation. And China is emphasized the local self the government the uh, government government. So we have so huge local powers. How to balance between the central power and the local co the powers? Other issue is really important. Um, constitutional reviews that that is the very uh, uh, big challenges about in the future China how to the uh, design the, the wonderful constitutional reviews in the other. Uh, some uh, uh, issues. And uh, look at that, um, I just introduced that um, structure of the state organization. When we are talking about the China law of law and the judicial independence, some scholars think about um, that says the uh, necessary under communities, under MPC. But the um, China constitution really clear, designed, so a uh, structure of the state organization. My country is that um, the system is similar. Uh, UK, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, parliament sovereignties. MPC, National People's Congress, have some uh, superpowers. Uh, any decision, policy decision, the, uh, from uh, MPC, or standing committee of the MPC, and other under MPC and the uh, SC MPC, we designed five central organizations, including Supreme Court. And this year, to add a new organization, States Committee of the uh, Supervisions. That's the new organization is the um, that's anti-corruption and the combined some uh, organizations. Uh, this is that um, the uh, we are um, talking about the judicial independence. We need uh, the uh, uh, that's uh, understanding that the Supreme Court. Supreme Court is that um, according to Constitution, we have the, the Supreme Court and the High Peoples and the Intermediate People Court and the Local uh, People Court. And uh, for uh, judicial independence, China designed. Uh, the uh, six and the third court, court system. This is the new systems uh, designed by um, uh, three years ago. But now we have some uh, different areas. We are uh, uh, the uh, organizing the uh, third court uh, systems. This is, is that um, the uh, Supreme Court the uh, uh, proposed designed by the NPC. Why China is the uh, uh, designed uh, uh, circuit court? We need, uh, we, we just to learn some uh, US, some judicial systems. So for uh, in China, we need a China big country. So we need uh, some different areas uh, separate, so judicial powers. So we um, designed this. I think about this is a good the achievement of China judicial reform. That, uh, we are um, the constitutional professors, uh, may, must be uh, asked for. China Constitution, how to say judicial independence? Uh, look at uh, Article 126, China Constitution. It is the uh, clear uh, announced that um, the people's courts uh, exercise judicial power independently. I think about this is a China Constitution said. That's a super powers. This is the constitutional norms. So in China, we can see that um, all the courts, all the judges, you need guarantee judicial power independence. This power from uh, constitution. So my 
the all the charges and the uh, uh, this advisability to guarantee this the constitutional normal constitutional principle. I think about this the in China is the making the consensus about that. But then what is the uh, judicial independence in China? Uh, judicial independence China in China. I think about them. Um, Two kind of principle and the philosophies. First is the independence of the court from CPC, from uh, administrative powers and other organizations. The court, that's the organizations, we need the independence of all the political power and other organizations. Second is more importantly that all the some uh, judges have the independence, judicial powers. This is sometimes difficult. The typical. Court is the uh, organizations, the, uh, we, we say that, oh, you have some independence, that's okay. But um, the, we're talking about um, independence of the judges. Every judge, uh, in fact, the practice have independent judicial power. That's uh, we um, idea is very clear, but um, look at the reality. Sometimes I tell you truth, they, that is some difficult. Uh, this is the uh, constitutional relationship among the three organs, uh, including court and the public security organ and the procuratorate. So constitutional article 140 of the uh, clear how to balance different powers. Uh, sometimes China is that, um, the, uh, making the misjudgment. Uh, My uh, law school, so the, uh, uh, the professors, uh, Professor He Jianghong writing the, in the books, the writing the, in the English. The name in that um, back from the death. Uh, in China, happened some uh, ju uh, misjudgment about um, death penalty. So Professor He is that um, criminal professor. He um, think about in China how to control misjudgment, especially death judgment. Uh, so that's a very important. That we clear the, uh, the uh, writing the judicial independence in constitution. But the more important are the how to guarantee. I think about in China, uh, through the, the five some uh, thinking or uh, mechanisms, first is that um, we must be um, uh, making the consensus about um, independence, judicial independence is that um, the uh, universal values. Any country, we need uh, judicial independence. But then secondly, China has some different the, the, uh, political systems. So independence from the administrative power in China. Government have the big power. So you are independent first from uh, independence from a government. Third is the judicial transparency. China is emphasized transparency. Uh, people like the understanding why, how to make in this decision about the human rights and other areas. So you look at the China uh, the judgment the online, you can find uh, so many uh, cases, so many people visit the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the online. So according to the, uh, the uh, uh, Supreme Court rules, all the, okay, all the uh, cases uh, except national security and the private, uh, they are opened. So, uh, uh, the, Judgment. So this the online is really important item for China. How to keeping judicial transparency. And the China is that um, the uh, emphasize account accountability systems. Judges have the judicial independence. You have right. You can decide any decision. But um, you have the responsibility for uh, human rights, and uh, you abide the constitutional the uh, principles. Other is that in um, China. New uh, reform that uh, guidance case. Uh, traditional China is the civil law systems, but um, now is the uh, including Supreme Court to learn the common law systems, especially from uh, Hong Kong. You know we are um, uh, the enforcement of one country two systems. So Hong Kong is uh, provide uh, excellent common uh, law uh, thinking and the practices. So Supreme Court now is the design the guidance case. So uh, Supreme Court select a wonderful case and uh, announce that um, the uh, local and the court and the local judges and uh, to learn the some uh, uh, guidance case because this case is the 
hybrid civil law and uh, uh, common law. Uh, and uh, in China, the selection systems in uh, the, uh, the judicial system is, I think about them, uh, we can them three uh, process. One is that um, who become a judges, you need uh, participate national judicial examination. If you passed, you get some the qualified uh, the judges candidate. Uh, the law school students can the, um, uh, participate national judicial examination. That's very really difficult uh, examinations. Second is that um, judges and appointment the uh, uh, Congress. So uh, China implements that um, the People's Congress systems. All the judges are appointed by the People's Congress. Supreme Court chief judges appointment the MPC. Other um, uh, judges and uh, senior judges appointment the MPC SC. So local uh, judges uh, appointment the local Congress. This is China uh, systems. Uh, but um, recently, just the uh, two, uh, past two years ago, we um, now is the designed new uh, systems about the judges selection quota. We have uh, the how many uh, uh, judges, and uh, we have uh, uh, three hundred thousand judges in the national world. So many judges. So how to increase in pro professional skills? Not all the judges can decide uh, the. Uh, Judgment. So China is the uh, proposed new uh, systems about um, the uh, select more as uh, the uh, professional judges. We call the quota judges. Uh, we have some three hundred uh, thousand judges selected half, fifty percent. That's the uh, hundred fifty thousand judges become the uh, so quota judges. This is the uh, I think about very. Uh, uh, the um, useful for China, uh, increasing the judges' professional skills. Uh, that, that. Uh, now, is the, uh, in the different uh, the, uh, uh, locals, uh, the Guangdong province and the Shanghai province, and uh, now the enforcement of these new systems. I think about this uh, two uh, years, but uh, I think that's very good, uh, the uh, systems for uh, increasing judges' skills and the uh, area. Uh, how to selection? That um, the, uh, we have some uh, committees, selection committees, yes. So all the, the uh, quota judges selection from uh, committees, uh, local and the Supreme Court. Committee members from uh, uh, bar, uh, the associations and the lawyers and the professors and the other social the, uh, uh, organizations. Uh, we hope that, um, or we enforcement that the um, committee is the, uh, keeping independence. But now, as China is the faced huge challenges, what are the challenges? I think about them. I like to focus on the five of the areas. One is that we need to establish constitutional review systems. So, just independence, the uh, we we talking about the principle. But then how do uh, enforcement? The key word, the key issue is in China is the you need to guarantee constitutional the. Uh, uh, the ideas. So now we are wondering about um, how to the design the China constitutional reviews, uh, the uh, German models and the France models and the uh, US models or the, um, the UK models. I wondering that. Um, but um, I think after two years, three years, we maybe uh, design the new models. Uh, three that um, the um, we need some. Uh, uh, look at the CPC and the judicial independence. This is so uh, uh, complex the problems. But I believe that the CPC is the political parties must be uh, by the constitution. CPC have so many the, uh, members. Uh, I, I check at 86 million oh, the, uh, party members, uh, six. Uh, six, six, uh, 86 million, yeah, that's the big. So uh, all, all the members abide the constitution, that's okay. So uh, that's uh, the, maybe uh, three uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, challenges. Third, that um, we need to balance the democracy and the professional judiciary. I like the democracy, but uh, when I'm talking about um, judicial, the uh, professional, 
We don't need so emphasized democracy because the judicial process is really sometimes different between the democracy philosophy and the professional philosophies. So audience idea are very important, that, but then sometimes audience ideas may be good choice. So I like them. China is really a court is keeping the independence professional. Maybe every case listen to a public audience. Okay. So uh, I have some uh, a conclusion, but the rule of law not a conclusion. So uh, thank you for uh, the uh, nation. Thank you.